people that watch Panoptos would have been pissed. No, I get I, more than three people watch the Panoptos. Although at the end of every semester, I always have someone say, "Wait, there were Panoptos? I could I could watch that the whole time." I'm like, "Yeah, said it eight times." What's new though? All right, study tip for the day is to enjoy what you're learning, right? Now, I know sometimes you have to take classes that you aren't exactly in love with, right? This semester I'm taking Sociology 1010. I'm literally just taking it because it's on the MCAT, and so I, I'm not like necessarily fascinated by the material, but I've found that studying for it goes a lot better just even just telling myself, well, this might be on the MCAT, right? So I'm going to need to know this. Okay, so if you find yourself in a class going, oh, I just don't want to study this. I just don't want to do this. This is so boring. This is so lame. This is so dumb, which you'll probably do at any point in any class. I've even had classes that I love, but there's you know a chapter or two where I'm like, this is dumb, right? Um, Find a reason to care. Find a reason that it matters or that you enjoy it or whatever, and it will go so much better, right? Just, this, just the psychological difference between saying, no, I actually I need to know this, I want to know this, I like knowing this, whatever it is, makes a massive difference in your study, okay? So when we get to evolution, and you have to memorize every kind of pre-human species and when they existed and where they came from and what, that, what tools they made and you're sitting here going, I don't even, I don't care if they made arrowheads or not. Find a reason to care. Even if it's just, I'll get a good grade on the test, right? Biology fact. Um, I may have actually already shown you guys this one now that I think about it. Did I tell you about this last semester? Dolphins give each other names. Then never mind, but dolphins give each other names for those of you that don't know or remember. They make unique calls for each other and that's how they communicate. So someday we'll understand dolphin, right? Okay, I've decided to change things up for today's session because I start every session with, what do you guys want to talk about? And then you stare at me blankly for 45 seconds and I go, well, we don't have time for this. And we carry on. So instead, I'm forcing you to do it. The next five to seven minutes will be dedicated to you writing down things that you want to talk about, questions that you have about the material, subjects that you are having a hard time wrapping your head around, things from class that you're going, wait, I didn't understand that, right? Just whatever you are most concerned about. Make up your own test questions, right? Do, do whatever you got to do for the next five to seven minutes to just come up with material that you're struggling with or having a hard time with or want to know more about. Right? It's got to be for this class. Not, not that I ever stay on topic of this class, but you have to. Um, then the next five to seven minutes, you will pair up with someone next to you. Everyone will pair up, even the introverts. You will find one other person. If there's uneven numbers, then threes, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, pair up and answer each other's questions as many as you can, as best as you can. Right. And there may be one that neither of you know, right? So then we'll save that for the next five to seven, well, just however much time. Then you guys all just ask them out loud. I'll answer them, or you'll answer them, or we'll Google them, right? Whatever we got to do. And then I have some slides. Obviously, I didn't just come here with literally one slide. Um, and then we'll go on to my slides. But again, they're, they're pretty much the standard stuff, right? Just reviewing what we've already talked about in class. So I don't want to stand up here and drone at you for 47 minutes or whatever. So time starts now. If you got to look at your notes from class or PowerPoints from class to kind of remind yourself what the subjects are, and it can be anything that's going to be on exam one, right? It doesn't just have to be immune system and osmoregulation but try and figure out where you're struggling and what you want to talk about. It's mandatory, okay? I'll let you know when time's up and you can pair up with a neighbor and start to talk with them while I look at Facebook. No.
All right, start wrapping it up. And then mo the, the best thing would probably be able to, the best thing would be to go through and prioritize. Okay, so say like this is definitely the one or two or three that I really want to know the most about that I think are the most important or the most difficult or the most likely to appear on a test, right? And just kind of go through in, in that order of most important because there's a pretty good odds depending on how many questions you've written. We may not cover everything, right? So make sure you get that most important stuff covered first and then just start pairing up, right? And overcome the awkward, I'm sitting eight seats away, just pair up anyway. Okay, find somebody, go. Again, odd numbers, if it's not working out, just pair into threes. Everybody has to find somebody, okay? If you wanna just pair up behind you, pair up in front, left and right, whatever is easiest. Make sure everybody's with somebody. Again, five to seven minutes.
All right, guys, start wrapping it up. People watching Panopto can start paying attention again. All right. How many of you got at least one question answered? Pretty good portion of you. How many of you still have questions left? Be honest. The rest of you have no questions at all. Why are you here? I'm, I'm not that entertaining. You have to have questions in order to be here, right? That's the whole point. The point of this exercise, too, was to show you every time I get up here and I say, what do you guys want to talk about? What do you have questions about? And you just kind of stare at me blankly. The idea behind this was you always have questions. There's always something that you won't understand. There's always something that you could understand better, right? That's just how life is and how learning works. You will never understand everything about everything, OK? Um, but a lot of the times, you don't know what your question is until maybe the material is presented to you, and then you go, oh, I don't understand that. Or you don't know what the question is until you take a minute to look at something and really look at it and go, this is what I do understand. This is what I don't understand. And in that, now you have your questions, right? So let's talk about it. Just start raising hands and asking questions. Because I made you make a list. I know you have some. T cells and helper T cells. Let's find that slide. So here we have T cells. Okay. Somebody walk me through it. And obviously, I've given you a little bit of help putting it up here. What's a T cell? First of all, does anybody know what T cell stands for? Thymus cell, right? Okay. What is it? Secrete antibodies? I think you're thinking of the other one. B cells are the ones that secrete antibodies. T cells then, they don't secrete <laughs> antibodies. Not as hard as it sounded. Um, but what else? So we know what it's not. Keep going. Do they identify pathogens? They identify pathogens. Perfect. What do they do? Yeah, yeah, they start screaming, hey, look what I found, bring more, right? What do, they, what do they do after they've found something and start screaming, hey, and other T cells start to come, then what? What do they do? They attach to it, right? So they have a very specific antigen receptor. What's an antigen? Yeah, it's a protein yeah. sticking off of a pathogen. What's a pathogen? Yeah, something that causes disease, right? OK, so they have a specific uh, matchup from T cell to antigen, and they bind to it. Then what? If they're not secreting antibodies, Yep, they'll either surround it and eat it or inje inject inject um, lysosomes and other digestive enzymes into it to break it apart, right? So th is there a question? Yeah, so is it um, phagocytic then? Yes. Okay. It breaks stuff down, right? I think that's pretty much everything to understand. There, yeah. And then the other part of the question was T cells versus helper T cells. So what's a helper T cell? I don't have a slide on that, so you'll have to use your own wits. Look at your notes. Wouldn't it assist the T cell? You're along the lines, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, that's why we call it a helper T cell. Perfect, yeah. 
Does anybody feel like they can go into more detail? Oh, I have another question. Oh, go into a little bit more detail on this one. Helper T cells. Google it. Look at your slides from class or notes. Doesn't it um, identify on the MHC and then it can tell other cells to come and help? Yeah. As well? Exactly. So it, it helps the T cell by bringing the other cells in and telling them what kind of antigen we're dealing with, right? We don't want to bring in every single T cell. Most of them won't even match up, so it's a complete waste of time, right? It's like if we have a flood and you start bringing in the fire department, great, uh, it's a little backwards. Maybe they'll take the water to the fire, I don't know. You've got to use the help of T cells to get the right T cells to the right spot, right? So it says, hey, this is whooping cough, bring in the whooping cough T cells. How do you mean? Like, does it release them or tell them to go anywhere? Or? The helper T cells? Yeah, or no? Mm, I, don't, I don't know where like, the specific crossover would be on that one. Okay. That may be one to study up on your own. I would also be surprised to see that depth on the test, though. Okay. That is a good question. You stumped me. OK, so you had, does that answer everything you were looking for? Then you had a question. Okay. You got it. I just, in my rambling, fixed it. All right. That never happens. So what exactly is a nephron? A nephron? Yeah. Okay. So first off, where is a nephron? Kidney. Kidneys. Okay. So anybody feel like before I get to the slide, they're brave enough to even just give a basic idea of a nephron? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, it's the, it's the functional unit of the kidney, right? So each individual, well, well I'm, I got more detail on it, I promise. But the kidney is made up of a bunch of nephrons, right? So there, you put a bunch of nephrons together, you get a kidney. And as was explained, the purpose of, and I might actually have a, an exact picture, but this will do. The purpose of the nephron and in a whole, the kidney is filtration, right? Filtration of what? Blood. Toxins out of our blood and interstitial fluid. What else comes through your kidneys? It eventually comes out urine. So we're filtering just a lot of stuff, right? Um, so when your kidneys fail is when you go on dialysis and the dialysis machine sucks literally your blood and all kinds of stuff out of your body and filters it through a machine and then puts it back in. Because that's what your kidney does, it's just inside of you, right? Um, I'm glad you've asked this because this tends to be one of the more difficult concepts for this exam because of the amount of processes and concepts and all that that go into kidneys. Okay, so we're going to break it down. There are five uh, key parts of the nephron. The other two are on the next slide because I just I, I stole these straight off of Dr. Bobeck's slides because I didn't feel like taking the time to recreate this somehow. Okay, so proximal tubule. First off, proximal, what does it mean? Close, close. close right? So if, if you're having a hard time remembering the order, proximal means close. It's, it's the closest. It's the first thing that you encounter, right? So water, nutrients, salts, uh, they get absorbed here, right? So you drink a Mountain Dew, and, you know, we don't want most of that in our body, so you shouldn't have done it in the first place. But your kidneys go, all right, well, I really don't need... 400 milligrams of caffeine, let's, you know, get rid of some of that. So, and the water that you drink obviously isn't exactly how your body needs it, so it'll get rid of some things and, and move some stuff around, right? So just remember water, nutrients, and salts are first. The descending limb, okay, so we've hit our proximal tubule, salts, nutrients, water. The descending limb 
of the loop of Henle. This whole thing is the loop of Henle, the descending limb, which, which obviously it's going down, but is it going into like the middle of the kidney or towards the out layer of the kidney? It's going into the kidney, right? So this is the cortex. It's kind of this top layer. The outer medulla is about here in the middle, and the inner medulla is closest to the middle of the kidney, right? So water goes down, right? It gets absorbed out of the tube, the descending limb, and into the flesh, essentially, of the kidney, right? And, and, and again, of the nephron. I'm trying to bring it back to the question. That's one nephron, right? So you, you suck it out of the distal tubule and into the nephron. Now, this picture is kind of misleading because that looks like it's one nephron. That's just kind of, they've cross-sectioned it. We have like, I think like a million nephrons in our kidneys, right? So they're not it's not like that. That look makes it look like there's like seven. There's like 500,000 on each kidney, right? So they're very small. Okay, so water comes out. Okay, we get all the way down here and it starts to go back up. Now salt starts to come out, right? NaCl actively transported out, just still into the flesh, into the medulla of our kidney, right? So it's permeable to solutes, not to water. Why wouldn't we want it to be permeable to water? Huh? We need water, right? <laughs> we just got it out. Why would we put it right back in? Not super useful, right? And again, we just keep sending salt out all the way up. Then we get to the distal tubule, distal like distant, right? Far away. Um, I guess I should go on. Distal tubule, okay, this segment. It regulates salt and potassium, okay? So it, it can, what it's trying to say here by varying their absorption and secretion is you have too much salt, then we stop absorbing so much salt. You have not enough salt, we absorb more, right? So this one can kind of homeostatically regulate, right? It can say, well, I don't have enough or I have too much. Let's absorb more, let's absorb less, right? And it helps with the pH, right, of our, of our body. Too high of pH, absorb a little bit less. Too low of pH, absorb a little bit more, right? Then finally, we go all the way down into our collecting duct. I don't want to worry about that. Urea, which is what makes up your urine, right? And water come out. We get more and more water. Again, as was stated, we just, we need water, right? That's how we survive. So we want to get as much water out of all this stuff as we can, right? So that's, yeah, that's about all. Um, how often is this happening? Is this like just when you drink something or have to kind of? Um, it's more or less constant since we're always kind of running. But yeah, if you drink, then it does it more, if that makes sense. The more, the more fluids you put in, the more the process runs. I don't know if you can necessarily speed it up, but yeah, you can oversaturate yourself, right? Have you ever drank so much water that it like starts to hurt, right? Have you ever noticed it kind of hurts in your kidneys too, just a little bit? Maybe it's just me, maybe I drink way too much. But if you drink like a lot of water, it will, it'll overfill your kidneys and you can get a little bit of pain there, right? And then obviously if you dehydrate yourself, it also is not the most pleasant experience. But yeah, it's, it's more or less constant. Other questions on this? Did that answer your question of what a nephron is? Did it, was it way too much? No. Oh, all right. Yeah. So if you're drinking a lot of water, then does it absorb less water in the process, or does it try to absorb something in the water? 
It, that's actually right here. That's a good question. So, we all know, they told you since like second grade, if your pee's clear, it means that you're hydrated, right? Is that true? It is. <laughs> I just wanted to see if I could trick you guys. Yes, it is. Um, why? Why does clear P equal I'm hydrated? There's not solutes in it. Okay. Keep it going. Does your body feel like it's okay to get rid of a lot of water? Yeah. Perfect. So I'm hydrated. I've got enough. So I don't uh, absorb a lot of water out of the tubules and into the kidney, right? I just let it keep going, and then you get dilute urine, right? Your kidneys become less permeable. If not water permeable means your kidneys just got less permeable to water. They suck out less water, you pee out more water, right? And so having yellow urine is concentrated urine, right? You don't have enough water, so you've taken pretty much all the water out of the urine, and it's just urea and a few other things, vitamins and whatnot, that's when you get yellow urine, concentrated urine, right? Then if you get like brown urine, either you're bleeding or um, you're bleeding in your, in your bladder or in your kidneys, or you just don't have enough vitamins, right? And so the only thing that's coming out is that uric acid. I've heard people like peeing blood when they're dehydrated, is that like a real thing? Yeah, if you get... If you get way too dehydrated, the lining inside starts to dry out and crack, and you'll bleed into your own bladder, and then that'll come out. Or if you have kidney stones, the kidney stones will bounce around in there and cut it up, and then you'll bleed out urine. So if you ever start peeing blood, call someone. <laughs> not me. Call a doctor. Just to make sure I'm not looking at the background, the things being pulled out of this loop, those are the things being taken out of the body, or like they're bring, yeah, so it's a little counterintuitive. They're being absorbed into the kidneys and kept in the body. And then whatever's not absorbed goes down the collecting duct and eventually out into the urine. Okay, so yeah. the water and salt being absorbed is staying in the body. Yes, yeah. So then why is it absorbing urea then out of this step? Is it? This urea being pulled out, as far as I understand it, it's, it's just a small portion. Most of it also gets um, urinated out, but some, some stays behind. The why on that, I don't know. How do the nutrients get transported from the kidneys to where they need to go? Like after they're so you're saying like once they come here, how do they go everywhere else? Um, I mean, if I had to take like a 99% sure guess, I'd just say through your blood, right? You have... You have veins and arteries on your kidneys, I would guess just through your blood, if I had to assume, because I don't, I don't know of any other way for them to get out, so yeah. But if I'm wrong, you guys can fact check me and, and tell me. That's what I would guess. Other questions on this? Okay, other questions from your lists? Um, what are the, um, for the stages of the four-chambered stomach, Four-chambered stomach. Does anybody off the top of their head remember the like the cow? Yeah, that has the four. Think you got it? Say it one more time louder. Yes, spot on. Do you want to talk about them? Okay. I assumed, but I was like, maybe he just doesn't remember the four names. So that's not in my current slides, so we will look at Dr. Bobex. I assume it's going to be in digestion. So that is scrolling very slow. I'm just worried I'm going to pass it, you know. Um, four-chambered stomach. First off, why? Why even have four chambers? Okay. Keep going. Why? Uh, to yeah. So cows eat what? <coughs> Grass, right? Multicellular eukaryotic organisms can't digest cellulose, which is like pretty much all grass is with a little bit of starch, right? So they eat something they can't even digest. Who does it? Who, who digests it then? 
the what? The bacteria, right? Pro prokaryotes, microscopic organisms that live inside of their gut, digest it for them, and then they basically just steal the nutrients, right? So again, rumen, reticulum, omasum, obomasum. Um, someone pointed out in, in my session where I covered this that it's reverse alphabetical. So if, you, if you're having a hard time remembering them, rumen, reticulum, omasum, obomasum is in like backwards um, alphabetical order. And then honestly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like kill myself over the four chambers, but if you more or less just understand, rumen's where it all starts, right? It starts to break down. The reticulum is where the prokaryotes are, and they're the ones that actually digest the cellulose so that the cow can get the nutrients, right? The omasum, they, they, um, they vomit up what's been digested by the prokaryotes, right? They chew it a second time. So when you, when you talk about a cow chewing cud with like that weird like sideways thing that cows do, they're basically chewing like solid vomit. Right, which is awesome. Just to get extra nutrients out of it, right? Because again, grass is, is very rich in nutrients, but very hard to get them out, right? So it, it chews it a second time, then it goes to the omasum, right? So re swallowed and moves here, um, and then they start to suck water out of it. And then the obomasum, um, let's see, where is it? This is where the cow actually does digestion, okay? So that second line there, it's final digestion by the cow enzyme. So the cow can now actually digest after this whole long process can finally digest on its own and actually get the nutrients out of it, okay? I wouldn't worry more than that. So do all the herbivore animals do this or do just cows do it? Like do beer have four chromosomes as well or do they just eat more? I don't know which ones do and don't. Um, all, hooved do all hooved animals. Well, there you go. Um, if the, basically, if they if they eat grass, they have to have some kind of special adaptation, whether it's for chambers, whether it's just having the prokaryotes in there. But if grass is their main nutrient, then they have to have some special adaptation beyond just what we've got, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, so I don't, like, I don't know off the top of my head how many stomachs a deer has or a, a camel or what, but, or how many chambers. They're all one stomach, yes. That's an important distinction. So are the bacteria and the prokaryotes, are they just always in the cow? Did they produce them or did they have to get them? I mean, they didn't produce them on their own, but they just, they get them from their environment. Most of them actually live on the grass that they eat, because obviously that's what the prokaryotes eat. So they live in the grass, the cow eats the grass, and it's just a package deal. Gotcha. So actually not a bad way to do it, right? Other questions on this? Okay, other questions from your list? Time is up, you got five minutes. Okay, yeah, so not just inside the heart, but the whole system, yeah. Uh, why can't I? Circulation. So, what you're talking about. Do you guys want to look at this and then look at the next part or just at the kidney, how it goes from heart to other organs? No one acknowledged me. Two people nodded, so we're doing it. Um, and we'll do it quick, because we've already done it. But you have to know literally everything that's on that picture, OK? I, I say literally because literally, right? You have to know what a pulmonary vein is, what a pulmonary artery is, capillaries, uh, which capillaries are where, which isn't super hard there, you know, head and legs. but. You have to know where they are and, and how everything moves, okay? So this diagram starts 
on the right ventricle. And most of the time you'll see this start on the right ventricle. It's just kind of in biology, we've all agreed, let's start at the right ventricle, right? So it's the, it's the bottom half of the right side of the heart if you're, you have to think about it backwards because right, the heart's inside of you. So it starts in the right ventricle, okay? And where does it go from there? The diagram's even up there if you want to cheat. Huh? The lungs, but how does it get there? Pulmonary artery, right? I can't draw on this because I don't have it downloaded to the computer. So it goes from right ventricle up into the pulmonary artery. It branches to the right lung and to the left lung, right? And it enters these capillaries. What are these capillaries like fused to? The lung, what part? The alveoli, right? The alveoli are those little, little sacs on the very end of each of your bronchioles. They fill up with air, and then the capillaries that are like stuck to them take the air into the blood, right? They diffuse through the membrane, okay? So you've taken your blood and oxygenated it, so now it's red, right? Except that it's always red. And then from pulmonary capillaries, where does it go? into the pulmonary vein, because veins always go to the heart, arteries away from the heart. So we go into the left atrium, right? I try to, try to imagine it's kind of A-shaped, right? The ventricles are pretty V-shaped, so that helps. And then I just, I just tell myself that the atria are A-shaped, okay? We're in the left atrium. Where does it go from there? Left ventricle, super easy. Where does it go from there? up into the body, right? How does it get there? The aorta, okay? So try not, try not to skip and say, well, it goes from the left ventricle to the head. Yes, that's true, but don't forget how it gets there. Then it goes to the upper half and the lower half, right? This aorta branches into a lower and an and a upper, I guess. Um, and it gets deoxygenated because it's giving blood. Right? It's giving it to your brain, your eyes, your lungs, everywhere, right? Both halves. Then what does it do? Back into the heart, right? So into this right atrium. How does it get there? Vena cava, right? Anterior and posterior, meaning upper and lower. Sometimes see it as superior and inferior. Same thing, right? and we've made it all the way back around. Are we all clear on that? Essentially, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a straight shot and it, it'll branch along the way with the capillaries, but yeah, the aorta is the highway. And then the capillaries and things that'll come off of it are you know, just the side roads. Okay, we're pretty much out of time, but I will, if I can find it. Uh, maybe, maybe there's not a slide that I thought there was, but you, your question was also, how does it get to the organs? It's the same idea as how it gets to the lungs, except backwards, right? So it used to take deoxygenated blood to the lung and oxygenate it. Instead, it takes it to a kidney or a brain or a liver or whatever that has capillaries on it. Every, every, every part of our body has capillaries, right? We have trillions of the things. And they're the ones that let the oxygenated blood give the oxygen to the organs, right? Does that answer your whole question, more or less, now that we're out of time? All right. So if you guys want, you can hang on to your list of questions. Email them to me. Canvas message them to me. We can talk about them in my super session on Monday. We can talk about them in Hillary's super session on Friday. Whatever you want. I, I would hang on to your list. All right. Thanks for participating. Whoever's got the roll, if you could bring it up, please. Thank you.